Christian titles are subject to uh, the whole of the conference. I'm sure that you all look to that for. I must go to that lecture, having then been straight in an afternoon session and straight after a coffee break, giving people the opportunity to run away as well, um, to see all of you or see any of you here this afternoon. I'm very delighted that you're here. I will try and um, rattle through this as quickly as I can. A very brief introduction to who I am. I am a chartered building surveyor. Um, I specialise in historic building recording, so that's where the archaeological side overlaps and industrial archaeology as well. I do lecture for the RICS and the Society for Protection of Ancient Buildings on their um, historic building course, their conservation summer school that they run. And the other point that I do tend to mention quite often is that I used to get really, really cross back in the days before um, when you had to have pre-application assessments of significance. You'd often see a condition on a listed building scheme that I had prepared and I was very proud of the scheme that I came up and it said before commencement on site you had to have the building done carried out a building uh, historical building survey carried out by a qualified archaeologist and I thought how dare you I'm a historic building specialist I specialize in surveying buildings why have I got to get some hairy oik in to actually <laughs> do this building survey so on the best rounds of uh, if you can't beat them join them I went to the University of Bristol, did a MA in archaeology, and I grew a beard. So <laughs> that's me. That's what we're going to talk about. The subject I've been given is Building Cost Information service, uh, service, and I'm going to talk about sort of that early budgeting phase. I need a budget estimate for my project. OK, my estimate is three million. You don't know anything about it? No, neither, neither do you. Um, the way that I'm going to attack this is in sort of three hits. I'm going to look at very basic methods of estimating to start with. This is a bit of teaching grandmother to suck eggs. It'd be very simple and very, very basic. Then I'm going to do what I'm supposed to be doing, looking at the BCIS. I'm going to have a few sort of thoughts about archaeological cost impacts on a construction project in general. Um, and then I'm going to leave you with two questions, which will automatically, hopefully, lead into our discussions um, as part of what we're going to do as the, the forum bit at the end. So let's start by methods of, of estimating. I'm going to suggest that there are three methods of estimating, uh, four methods. Unit method, floor area method, the one I've underlined is the elemental cost, that's the one the BCIS really fits in with, um, and then the more detailed bill of quantities. You've seen from some of Steve's stuff about bills of quantities, how you can actually nail things down into individual items and the actual costs for those. Which one you're going to choose depends on all sorts of things, it depends on what's actually required, how accurate you have to be, what information you've got, uh, where in the process you are in terms of actually coming up with um, an estimate, are you at very early stage or is the scheme already relatively developed? But these general sort of four methods I'm going to sort of take you through very, very quickly. Um, the first one is what I would call the unit method. Unit could be anything. Um, it could be, in, we're at a university, so I'm going to use halls of residence. If the unit you're using is bed spaces for students, if you've just had a hall of residence built for, let's say, a thousand students, and it costs you 2.5 million. That works out, if my math is correct, at £2,500 per student. So if I'm now building a hall of residence which is 2,000 students, the math isn't that difficult, is it? Um, at cost per student of 2,500, it's going to cost you 5 million. Now, if you're spending 5 million pound, that's a very, very imprecise way of actually budgeting for something. But you could apply that to car parking spaces. How many cars was the previous car park? How many beds, a three-bedroomed house compared with a four-bedroomed house? Um, you could look at it for almost anything. Um, lecture theatres, number of seats in a lecture theatre, uh, number of um, tables in a restaurant or hotel. Now, as you can see, that's a very finger in the air, very initial budget type thing as a unit. It could be, how many trenches are you going to dig? Last, you know, that was a 10 trench one, this is a 20 trench. Oh, is it going to cost twice as much? It's a very basic level of, of, of estimating. It doesn't get us very far because there's so many other factors that we need to vary on, on that. So the next sort of um, thing to think about that is could we adjust that a little bit? Um, and if you've got the scenario where Hall B, for instance, is on steeply sloping ground, whereas Hall A is on flat ground, uh, both of those are genuine halls of residence, um, then you could kind of start to do an adjustment and start to refine your your estimating skills. And that's what we're talking about, budgeting, uh, preliminary budgeting stuff. The next sort of unit would be to say, well, actually, yes, use floor area as units, square meterages. And one of these 
um, areas would be to use something like the standard method of measurement. Now, there are, uh, you've already seen flashed up, um, civil engineers method of measurement as well. It's been suggested that archaeologists need a standard method of me measurement so that we can actually have a, um, a uh, industry-wide basis for how we actually measure things, a code of measuring practice. That happens to be the RSCS one there. We, RSCS tend to work on a thing called GIFA, which is uh, gross internal floor area. Sometimes people just refer to it as gross internal area. So I'm going to take the F and I'm going to change it to a little F like that just because it's <laughs> an appropriate way of doing things. But again, we're just basically talking on um, instead of using numbers of students, number of bed spaces or whatever, we're talking about actual floor areas. Now again, from an archaeological point of view, that might be a two hectare site compared with a four hectare site. Still not a very precise way of doing it, but you can see how you can get a ballpark figure. If the GIFA is 3,000 square metres and it costs £3 million, <coughs> it's £1,000 per square metre. And if you then look at the next one, uh, it's going to be 4,000 square metres, <coughs> of course your cost is going to be £4 million. Now again, very basic, basic ways of coming up with the price. Now you will be amazed how many clients get those initial ideas of four million pound or like the last one five million pound and that's their budget that's what they will work to and the fact that you then say well hang on the grand conditions are different oh there's this extra factor oh yeah but that's going to go over budget now that's what was being talked about in terms of risk the word risk has been mentioned plenty of times clients are trying to actually work to a budget why because they know at four million pound i can afford to do it at five million pound i can't and often those initial numbers that you give them go in their head and they stay there. And that's the problem that we as an, uh, a construction profession actually have. So the next way is to sort of take it a little bit further and break it down into elements. Now this is the thing that I'm going to focus on in terms of the BCIS um, uh, approach. If you actually take, in this case, Office A, and I split it down into elements such as substructure, superstructure, services, and I look at elements and I look at, well, the actual substructure of that costs so much, the actual superstructure costs this much, and then I look at the extra, next building and I say, well, actually, the substructure of that is more complicated. I've got, again, that way of adjusting those figures, and that's really all, all we're looking at here in terms of looking at elements, and you can see the standard categories coming across the bottom here. Now, from an archaeological point of view, these could be things like sites, stripping the site in terms of uh, taking the topsoil off, depth of excavation up to a certain depth, up to the next top, you know, 250 millimetres, the next 500 millimetres, the next metre or whatever it might be. It might be coming right the way through to um, artefact analysis, um, archiving, report writing, and those could be the elements that you actually include if you were to actually have a bespoke elemental method for costing a um, archaeological project. Okay. Another way of looking at it would be to use those terms that you saw a slide come up earlier, and it was in Tim's one about the PRINCE2, which has got the, um, the categories from briefing through to completion that the uh, RIBA have, and you could have those sort of categories as your main headings. And, and those would tie in with, with that as a, a, a profession-wide standard that you could actually have um, to look at. And you end up with bar charts and um, pie charts and things like that, which you can compare buildings, or in archaeological um, sense, compare sites. And a site in Leicester is going to be different from a site in London. Um, a site in Bath, where you'd expect to find Roman remains down to a, height, a depth of about 10 feet, um, then you know the depth that you're likely to go to. So you can compare it with another site in Bath. So locations might need to be brought into, into this in terms of how you, how you adjust things. So when you're talking about a building, this whole concept of an elemental cost method of actually taking something, breaking it down into elements, and then comparing things. Now, I'm not breaking it down into individual prices. This isn't a Wessex catalogue, a Spons a manual, a Spons price book, where you go down and say, how much is it for uh, fire doors? It's not that detailed. It's still very much in this preliminary estimating <coughs> stage so that you can actually get some sort of overall budget cost. The rationale for doing that is so that people know what's likely to be expected to minimise risk. And then the last 
logical step on from that is to actually go into a detailed bill of quantities where you actually have all the items broken down in terms of materials, labour cost, all the items right the way down through, and that's the, the full detailed uh, bill. Now that's probably how an archaeological project should be uh, specified. And that's again, was um, in Steve's talk, there was examples of, of you know, numbers of bags of, of, of pottery being, being assessed, etc. Okay, so that's a much more detailed, but it's still only working out a tender price as opposed to the actual cost of doing the works, but that's how you would work it through. The aim is that if you've done this level of detail and the client's aware of what's going on before it goes out to tender, when the tenders come in, that graph where the lowest tender and the highest tender are miles apart shouldn't happen. That all the tenders should hopefully be roughly in line with what you're expecting. Okay. Bills of quantities these days are, are very complicated. Buildings are, are more complicated than your average archaeological site. Um, we're talking about self-generating bills of quantities these days. If you put something through BIM, BIM's already been mentioned um, as a software package. You create the 3D model of it and it will automatically produce the actual bill of quantities um, as, as you do. I'm not expecting you to understand too much on, on that level because our students struggled with that after we've taught them for three years on it. So, <laughs> um, But we are basically talking about this initial sort of stage. Now, even with the archaeological project, the same applies here. That The more information you've got, the more accurate your cost estimate, your cost model is going to be. If you've got detailed plans... Uh, rather than just the building footprint, of course, you're going to be able to estimate closer to what that real tender price is going to be. So <coughs> to do this, you need to bring in as many people to give you information as possible at that early stage. The architect needs to be involved, the structural engineer needs to be involved, building service engineer, other design team members. Now, um, the comment was made earlier that because of risk, the contaminated land people are being brought in as part of the design team at an early stage. Surely we should be bringing in archaeologists at an early stage to discuss the risk factor that's involved in terms of that. Okay. So this brings me to what I'm supposed to be talking about, the BCIS. Uh, the BCIS is an information service. It's hosted by the RICS. Individual, individuals can sign up for it. Some of you will have come across this. I came across it the other day when I was applying for my own house insurance. And you type in age, number of windows, number of bedrooms, lockable doors, etc., etc. You fill in all the details. And it, will, it came up on this particular one with the BCIS estimated rebuild cost. Automatically came up. And that's one of its functions. It's giving you a rebuild, a rebuild cost based on the information that you put in. But when we look into the BCIS in, in more details, you will see that this is from the BCIS's uh, website, and it starts badging it and saying, for over 50 years, 1960s, was when the, the RICS started collating information on costs of um, buildings. And they base it on tender prices. And they have a tender price index, whereby you can adjust what the tenders are. And if you say that in 1985, uh, we'll call that 100 Obviously, back in 1975, things were cheaper, so that would be down at a lower level. And where we are now, we're obviously at a much higher level. Um, I think the current tender price index is about 229. So you can take a price that you had in 1985, adjust it to current prices. And that idea of adjusting things based on how old the tender is, is quite um, valid. Now, I've got no doubt that some of the larger firms here have their own set of data. They have their own information. Oh, we did a job 10 years ago, which was a similar sort of site. That's exactly what this is. Uh, but it's a national one. It's not individual firms having their own collective database. This is a huge resource of cost analysis, indices, studies, and forecasts. There's for future planning in terms of when the next recession is going to be, what prices are likely to do, so you can predict future costs as well. Okay. RICS has been doing this for a long time. It's what they do. Now, this slide is, um, it says, Welcome back, University of the West of England. At UWE, we've signed up uh, so that our students can use this. This is the page that comes up. And you can see down the left-hand side, some of the things that you can click on. You can click on the indices. You can see how they fluctuated over the time. You can click on average prices. There's life cycle costings in there. 
there's wages, there's day work, there's, there's all sorts of information. Conceivably, there could also be archaeological costs as part of the BCIS, perhaps. I don't know. Um, let me give you a case study. This is a, a project that we give um, our students to work on. Um, it goes to building surveying students and architectural technology students. And they're given this car park site in Redcliffe in Bristol. That's it there, car park just up on, on the top, just to the uh, northeast of the roundabout there. But of course, it's got a, interesting, it's got a grade one listed building, St Mary Redcliffe right next to it. Red cliffs are called red cliffs because there's red sand there that they made the Bristol glass out of, so there's caves underneath it, etc. Just make it nice and complicated for them. Um, we have information there, we give them a land registry plan about the ownership, so they've got to get the grips with all of that as well. And of course, what we expect them to do is what you're all familiar with map regression. You go back through and you realise that um, it was a car park, has been a car park. The 1969 plan shows it a car park. You go back to the 1955 one, it's got garage on it. Contaminated land, garage, petrol station, uh, and everything else. If you look just here as well, it says ruins. Why does it say ruins? Because of this plan. This is the Luftwaffe's plan of Bristol for when they were doing their bombing raid and they highlighted various uh, bits around the docks. There's the docks. So it was uh, obviously bombed and that's why there's, there's ruins on the, on the site. If you go back before 1955, go back to the second revision, you'll see that the shape of the site's very different. The dual carriageway that is Redcliffe Way, it wasn't there. There was a sort of a a curved terrace, perhaps it's a Georgian terrace, it looks quite Georgian in terms of its style there. Um, 19, that's the second revision, the first revision. Take it back through the first edition. <coughs> you can see there's a public house on there as well. So, you know, you would expect there to perhaps be a, a basement with a beer in there. I could get the beer reference in, it's an archaeological conference after all. <laughs> but then we get back to 1832 Ashley's plan, and you can see, oh, very different layout. That curved road structure's gone. Um, it's got a much more higgledy-piggledy, uh, more medieval layer. Bristol's a medieval city. Go back to Roach, Roach's um, 1742 plan, and you can see just two sides of an L shape and what looks like allotment gardens in the, in the background. Note the wall up the top says Port Wall Lane. It's called Port Wall Lane because the Port Wall, which went around the port for Bristol, um, is here, and this is what's called Redcliffe Gate. And then next to it, there's all sorts of St John's Hospital medieval site, and you can see the site is sort of over there. So a lot of historic or archaeology on the site. Just to give you a feel for what I'm getting my students to look at. And again, there's, if they do their research properly, they can find that there's, there are images of some of the medieval buildings. There's ones of that uh, late Regency, early Victorian terrace that was actually built there. Um, and even to the extent that some early photographs will show if you zoom in some of the buildings that were taken down and demolished in order to build that, um, that, that terrace. So there's, there's lots of information that they have to find out. Even on real archaeology, the Redcliffe Gate, taken down in 1772, it appears on, on the site. What they're expected to be doing on this site is putting a seven-storey building on it. And I want them to advise the client on the anticipated cost. I'm, I'm looking for them to actually say, look, the, the quantity surveyor has given this primarily budget. Is it a valid budget? They've said it's going to cost 15 million. I want you to actually make some cost savings on that. Now, some of the problems with this site means that some things they actually may have not been priced enough for, and they've got to actually look at what they can do. This is called Port War Place. This is next door to it. This was actually built. It's, it's only six stories, but this is what actually went on an adjacent site. When they were doing that, they found this. Okay? And the fundamental thing here, which I'm trying to get my students to understand, is this, there was a cost involved with this. I know what it is, I won't say what it is, but I, um, I do know how much that cost. I also know it took six months to do the investigation, and it delayed the site by six months. They also had to redesign the foundations to miss some of this archaeology, because it was determined that it was important. And having redesigned the foundations, it also meant they haven't got their car parking in the basement anymore. Now that has an effect on whether you can market the property with the basement or not. What the, those structures are is the basis of bottle kilns for Bristol blue glass, Bristol um, glass making industry. Um, uh, there is still um, one left, and that's all that's actually physically left above ground of Bristol's um, glass kilns. Um, that's the restaurant of the Hilton Hotel. Okay, let's get back to the BCIS. Let me try and now run through how my students would then use the BCIS, or a developer uh, would, would use this database. Um, to actually come up with some preliminary costs. 
you get various fields that you, you fill in with the information you want. Depending on how many of these you put in and what information you put, you will get a different set of data come back. Here I've said I want 1,000 square meters per floor, seven stories. Um, I could do it with a range, five to 11 stories. I'm telling the, the database, give me information based on this. That's down here, air conditioning, yes or no, basement, yes or no. Um, I can put some information in, in terms of look at this. I can also start to use some of these indices. I've already mentioned the tender price index. This is a location one. You can adjust it. For instance, if it's in Greater London, it comes in at 129. If we're saying that 100 is our average price, it's 29% more expensive <coughs> to actually build in London. If you look at, let somebody mentioned Chester earlier, so that would be in the northwest, it's 92. So it's 8% cheaper uh, to build in, in London. It does mean that if I've got a price of an office block in London, I can now adjust it to how much the same office block would have cost to have built had it been built in Chester. Okay, so my example is in Bristol, therefore I can look at the southwest and I can adjust it and it will do it automatically for me on the database. Um, and what comes back is 15 buildings in this particular case because of the information that I've, I've put in. Average cost here for a six story plus building, about £2,000. The highest one's coming in at 3500 So I can now make a, a cost ground floor area basis of how much I think that my building's going to cost to actually build. Okay, £2,000 per square metre, 7,000 square metres, we're talking 14 million I believe, is that correct? 14 million pound on that particular project. How can I make some savings? Now that's the very first fundamental level using that square meterage um, cost estimate. But it goes further than this. It goes into individual ones. Now I've blacked these out because obviously people have to pay for the, uh, um, the privilege of using the, the BCIS. So for, um, but if you actually sign up to the system you'll know exactly which ones these are and, and where, where they actually come from. And there would be a whole host of these depending on what information I put in. These were going to be the nearest ones. If I look at this one in the middle which is the uh, seven story example. Um, it's in City of London seven story office building, this one's got two basements. So I can still look at the price because the price for this one was coming in, um, if I go back, the price for this one rebased, it's already been adjusted for um, the, the, the date, it's 13 million pound basically on this one. And the adjustment of it, it's got two basements. Am I gonna have a basement or not? Can I have a basement? Depends on the archeology. span All of those sort of things can have a a, a large impact. So, and there's a whole host of information that comes up with this, even to the extent that you actually get a breakdown using those elements that we were talking about. This is the elemental method. Now, when you look at this, two things. First of all, substructure is £926,000. Now, substructure would include contaminated land issues, it would include archaeology as well as the actual physical cost of building the substructure. So there really ought to be on the BCIS system more details for this for a client to actually make an informed decision on the risk. But if we apply it in a different way and say, well, actually, if this was a archeological database, it doesn't actually go down into elemental units and elemental quantities at this stage, although you can actually on some of them get that information, uh, but it is giving me this breakdown. And if these were general categories of types of excavation, uh, whatever categories you want to come up with, then of course you can get an overall feel. And the more general the categories, of course the more likely the contractors are to actually provide their information. Very few people are going to actually want to give you the full breakdown of their actual cost of what they quoted. And back to the unfair contracts and the uh, various acts about uh, collusion and uh, everything else, you know, you could probably be in trouble if you actually had a, a database uh, uh, or a massive cartel of the whole of the archaeological industry. Uh, that's not what this is about. This is about trying to get some sort of budgetary uh, information. Okay, so you get the concept of what, what we're, we're doing. And again, because it's a database, you can start to pull graphs off. And these are with your mean, your average, and your maximums, and your, quant uh, your upper quartiles, and your etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So you can, you can get quite a lot of information from where we are. So 
just to finish off, how can archaeological cost impact on a construction project? If you Google archaeological costs, you will get very quickly a, a report, which was again information um, survey that was carried out by the City of London. Um, look it up, it comes up quite quickly when you sort of Google, it's fairly near the top. In that report, it states... Attendance, labour, citizen kind, etc., are likely to cost between 1% and 3% of the total construction cost where major, archaeological, major archaeology survives. Between 1% and 3%. Now, I was talking about a seven story building costing 14 million. 1% to 3% of 7 million is quite a lot. But if I'm talking about a 70 story building, the actual archaeology cost is still going to be on the same footprint. So the percentage cost of a 70 story building is going to be negligible. The archaeological cost of a seven story building is going to be higher. So, this is of no use to anybody whatsoever. Although you will be struggling to find um, my students when I ask them to put an archaeological cost towards that project in, on, in Redcliffe, they struggle. But this very document goes on to say developers generally recognise that archaeological consultants should be engaged at an early stage in the development. It says developers are far more concerned about the effects of delays on their project than about the direct costs. <coughs> Particularly in London, where every square millimetre is worth thousands and millions of pounds over, over time, the cost of doing the archaeology overall is actually not a huge, significant part. However, having the project stored for six months, a year, could be a very significant cost to the archaeologists. So it's something that the construction industry generally needs to get its head around. So, just to summarise some of the things I've been saying there, cost estimation side of things, clients are in that decision making process. Something like the BCIS database can help, but the BCIS database does not have that archaeological information in there. The principles of having a database can also be applied to archaeological uh, projects, so there's a two phase thing here. One is, would a database of this sort of nature help archaeologists, and the other side is, if archaeological information was available, would that minimise risks from the construct to the construction industry as well? Of course, there's things like indices, and you can rebase it for location, and if there was an archaeological da database, the search criteria that you would type in when you were trying to find a comparable would be whatever you wanted. Instead of the number of stories, how many, how, what's your anticipated depth? And for most city centre sites, we do now know what the anticipated depth of the archaeology is likely to be from similar projects in that area. And instead of the type of construction, you know, you type in whether it's a steel frame or a concrete frame, etc., in the BCIS database, perhaps you would type in, I'm looking for examples of medieval, or I'm looking for uh, ones where they anticipate finding Roman archaeology. So you can have a bespoke database um, if it was useful. So those two last questions that I wanted to sort of throw out there, having given you a very brief introduction to what the BCIS is, is would an archaeological cost database help construction projects in general, in terms of more information for something like the BCIS so that clients can actually anticipate what the risk is? And the other one is, would an archaeological cost database actually help archaeologists in terms of how they then develop the brief before they actually come up with that detailed written scheme of investigation, um, which they'd actually, and actually get priced with a proper bit of quantity effectively in a proper detailed way? <coughs> and just to finish, because we're in Leicester, I saw this on the side of the bus. Uh, uh, proof of the best football isn't the most expensive. And that again ties in with, you may find that once you've got that detailed um, pr price costing, um, you know, if people are comparing uh, a comparable one, it might well be that what instead of actually going with the cheapest one, people are saying, well, everyone's based on the same basic level of information. Therefore, um, I will go with you uh, because of your expertise or whatever it is. And that's basically all of this.